All right, everyone. I think that we will get started um, just with a couple introductions first. And I know I keep seeing people rolling into our webinar here. Uh, we're very pleased to have you. And we're also very happy um, for the partnerships between XPRIZE and the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. My name is Peter Houlihan. I am the technical lead of the Rainforest XPRIZE. And I'm really excited because over the next uh, couple weeks, couple months, uh, I'll be hosting what we're now calling Tropical Thursdays with staff from the Natural History Museum in LA, um, having different conversations about natural history on, in terms of the tropics, but also um, on local levels. You know, we're all confined to our home offices and home schools and all of these different situations amidst the pandemic. And so it's both an opportunity for us to um, escape a little bit uh, mentally <laughs> and get to the outside world, but also as you'll see with Miguel tonight, uh, there are many opportunities to still explore your own backyard and also be involved with citizen science, contributing to science in your own communities um, where we can all be most impactful. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief little introduction about myself before give, getting into this entire evening, which is all about Miguel and his phenomenal work um, in the LA area and abroad. He's, he's done incredible work and you're going to be very excited. He's also shared um, some, some great photos and videos of his work around the world um, that you'll be excited to see. So. As I said, my name is Peter Houlihan. I'm the technical lead on the Rainforest X Prize. The Rainforest X Prize is a $10 million five-year competition to revolutionize the way that we study and survey tropical rainforests to improve the ways in which we can uh, act and improve conservation of these threatened environments. And my personal background is specializing in expedition ops in tropical rainforests, uh, coordinating logistics and access, facilitating permits and visas for teams of local scientists and experts to access very difficult to, to reach um, environments. And tropical rainforests are very demanding and challenging for a variety of reasons um, around the world. And so uh, a big part of my work has been getting teams of local scientists and local communities to work together in surveying tropical rainforests to work towards improving policy in those areas. Um, I, like Miguel, started as a biologist studying all sorts of um, organisms in tropical rainforests, a little bit in coral reefs, but um, many topics from butterflies to a few topics that I'm really thrilled to hear from Miguel about tonight in terms of bats and big cats and other carnivores. Um, so we'll be spanning quite a few topics and Miguel is really truly an expert um, in these aspects. And so um, without further ado, I'll introduce um, our exciting first guest for our Tropical Thursdays, uh, Miguel Ordignana. And Miguel is the manager of community science at the LA Natural History Museum. Um, he's been there since April of 2013 as an environmental educator and wildlife biologist. As a community science manager, Miguel promotes and creates community science projects and recruits and trains participants. He utilizes his mammal research background by conducting urban mammal research in LA and he co-leads the Natural History Museum of LA's Southern California Squirrel Survey, which you'll get to hear about tonight. There are some great photos to share. Um, he also continues his work locally and internationally on carnivore and bat research, including a jaguar project in Nicaragua. So what I'm really excited about is, is the flexibility um, of Miguel's experience and expertise. Um, and really, I think tonight, a key focus is um, all of these places, especially for myself, a lot of times these tropical environments feel so intangible, they're far away to travel to, they're difficult to get to, um, but there are ways to communicate this work and more importantly there's ways to get involved on a local level, um, to participate in your own communities, and to be active in that way and contribute to science. And so um, with that I really want to turn it over to Miguel to give um, 
a general overview a little bit more of your current work and then we're going to hit a few different projects from squirrels to bats to jaguars and just go from there and one last thing um, as we get going please add your questions there's a q a function in the um, zoom window so if you scroll over the bottom a bar should pop up and you can type your questions in the q a and we'll, uh, Miguel and I will answer those at the end or maybe a few along the way. So with that, uh, it's a pleasure, Miguel. All right. Thanks, Peter. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. So it's, uh, it's really not just um, professionally um, exciting work and uh, goals that I've met uh, by being able to do some of the work that I've done but also meeting a lot of personal goals of mine, uh, kind of giving back to uh, LA's inspiring ecosystems in my own way through not just research, um, but also outreach and engagement with community members um, who otherwise are uh, often disconnected from urban nature and see themselves separate from nature. Uh, and so I work at the Naturistry Museum um, and this is a place where people typically think about dinosaur fossils and beautiful diorama halls. And, um, and as a local uh, to LA and going to this museum, that's kind of the message I got too uh, at that time. And I, would, I was really captivated by the diorama halls, the settings that were depicted there and would transport myself mentally to these places um, like Africa, for instance. Um, and, but uh, although I was inspired to care about these animals because of those beautiful exhibits and pursue conservation, I felt an aspect of conservation was intangible to me. Um, and more specifically, uh, because I grew up in Los Angeles and not, none of the wildlife or nature that I uh, came across were represented at museums very well at all or at zoos and so um, and also on top of that the people that I would encounter randomly studying uh, animals or educating people about these exhibits um, didn't look anything like me or any of my family members and so uh, even though I'm, I'm not too old I think we've gotten a long way uh, with regards to environmental education and research in urban areas. And uh, I'm a big part of that uh, effort here in Los Angeles. And so as far as my current projects, I kind of act as a liaison between uh, research projects or scientists and curators that lead uh, urban, e urban wildlife um, projects and surveys um, and the public and the general public. And so, I get the public engaged in this work um, through accessible programs, through trainings, through the use of technology uh, like the iNaturalist app, and sometimes using traditional um, tools that I would use in the tropics um, or in very wild places and trying them out in people's backyards um, and, and their personal spaces to get not just the information that the scientists want or are after, but also to connect the public with this type of science um, and these, these more elusive species um, on a very personal level because we're in their personal space. And so, um, so yeah, so that's kind of generally my, my role. And then some projects that I have ongoing right now is the Southern California Squirrel Survey which is based on iNaturalist and is a project that in, involves getting the public to use an iNaturalist app, which is basically like Facebook or Instagram for nature nerds like myself. And instead of taking that photo and just uploading it to social media for your friends to see and, and like, um, your the goal is to actually turn that photo into a data point and make it useful not only to uh, for engagement and, and education purposes, but also for scientific um, research. And so by um, tagging these photos with a location, date and time stamp, um, you're able to uh, turn this beautiful photo of a Western gray squirrel, for instance, or this fox squirrel into a valuable data point. And for the Southern California Squirrel Survey, 
like a lot of other projects in at the Natural History Museum, our focus is to look at how um, the distribution has changed over time um, with these species. And museums have been doing that for years. Uh, my museum is, is 100 years old, and that's been what, what we've done um, with our collections, is use these records, physical records, to um, try and map out um, the historical distribution over time for different species. And now with the help of technology, we're able to kind of fill in some information gaps with the help of the public, uh, which allows us to get more information, um, but also um, engages the public in this, in this effort, which is important for them to feel, feel involved um, and, and, uh, and feel like they need to be st better stewards um, of this environment. And so, um, so that's kind of the squirrel survey. Our goal is, the main focus is to map um, this turf war that's going on between the Eastern Fox Squirrel, which was imported from the Eastern United States by Civil War veterans. They brought them over either as pets or as food. Um, to West Sawtell Veterans Home in West Los Angeles, and they were thought of mis um, they were thought of as um, cute little animals at first, but then they were being fed table scraps, and because it was a government facility, they were thought of as using mis a misappropriation of government funds, and so they had them all released, um, and they were tolerated for a while because they're a novel species to the area. But we had a big orchard industry at the time, and they're all of a sudden creating a lot of damage and um, economic loss. And so, but by the time they decided to get rid of these fox squirrels, it was too late. Um, they didn't realize how prolific they were, how adaptable they were. These species reproduce um, twice a year. They're very bold. They eat about anything you can put out there for them, um, including they've stolen my sandwich um, before at lunchtime. So they're really uh, feisty little uh, animals. and um, we have two main native uh, squirrel species, the California ground squirrel um, and the Western gray squirrel. And both of the, the California ground squirrel is native, but to the area, um, but it's also similarly very adaptable uh, to the environment and eating, eats a lot of different things, uh, burrows in anything that's, um, that's available and, and um, there's not too much cover overhead where raptors can hunt them. Um, Western gray squirrels on the hand, like this one here, um, have lost their their territory pretty quickly to urbanization main, mainly, but the fox squirrel introduction and expansion has really exacerbated that problem because they're aggressive, they're, they're pushing them out and displacing them from their, um, their original territory. And so, um, the only place you can find the Western Gray Squirrel now in the LA Basin, which is usually be, used to be one of their main strongholds, is now Griffith Park. That's it. Um, otherwise, you have to go to the San Gabriel Mountains, um, just north of and east of LA, um, or all the way west of west into the Western Santa Monica Mountains. And so that's kind of the story that we're trying to investigate um, with the help of the community. And because the fox squirrel is so urban adapted, um, it's, it's crucial for the public to be involved. And it's also, I strategically chose this, these study species because of all the mammals that still are around in LA, these are the only group of animal or mammals that are diurnal, that are active during the day. So it makes this project more accessible for the general public, which is important for a community science project to be successful. Um, has to be accessible. Yeah, and so um, the other project uh, I've gone, I've done a lot of camera trapping, which is kind of traditional um, research, uh, including on the LA River, um, like you see here. I, I, we did a monitoring of the LA River to look at the potential of the LA River um, for as habitat for wildlife, because there is, there are goals. Um, for restoring a lot of this river to its more and more natural state. And we wanna know what would happen if that were the case, what's there now, and what, what, how this situation can be improved with restoration. So I put camera traps out there, we got wildlife, and all this was very inspiring. Um, doing the squirrel survey, 
doing this more traditional um, urban carnivore research with motion activated cameras um, was something that I, I never really thought about doing in the middle of LA, even though I grew up there and I kind of knew the area pretty well. I considered this type of work, work that we needed, that had to be done outside of the city. And so um, for me to engage this in, in this work and be successful at it um, was very inspiring for me. So toting around a camera trap in the middle of LA will get you a lot of weird looks um, by people, setting this up in places where people aren't even thinking about wildlife. Um, but it's a payoff because you get some really engaging photos and videos from that and really make people think differently about their urban or natural surroundings once they know what's roaming around at night when they're asleep. Um, and so that, as I mean, really inspired me to look even deeper within the urban core, which I've done with the squirrel survey, for instance, um, and also now uh, through the backyard bat survey, which is my main project right now, which is another community science project where we're using um, acoustic monitoring devices um, to study where wildlife is, uh, excuse me, where bats are distributed within LA's urban core. Um, and what's crucial about this is, I mean, again, it's very strategically chosen because first of all, I have expertise studying, studying bats with acoustic monitoring um, and it's a handy tool, handy skill to have because these species um, navigate in darkness, communicate in darkness um, with echolocation or sonar is another word for it, and which is using high pitch sound to be able to get a mental picture of what's in, your, in front of you in pitch black darkness. Instead of using your eyes to see, using um, ultrasonic sound to see and navigate in space. And so um, this made this type of work accessible, just having that technology at my disposal and using these species specific calls uh, to be able to identify species rather than having to rely on capturing bats or taking photographs of them, um, which would have made the job a lot easier and almost nearly impossible in very urban areas. And so having this technology that, again, a lot of people use in the tropics and places where they expect, expect to see bats, um, it was useful, useful to have these little microphones to put up in people's backyards. And um, we made some amazing discoveries such as this bat here is a Western red bat and it's a migratory species that um, was thought to kind of skip over LA because unlike other bats that can roost sometimes under bridges or in people's roofs, this particular bat species is a part of a genus called Lazurus that um, roost in foliage primarily and almost exclusively. So the fact that LA is so urban and we lost a lot of our tree cover uh, that would have been that roosting habitat, um, we thought meant that they were gone. They're not going to use LA anymore. And so to find this bat in the middle of our nature gardens at our museum, and our museum is in South Los Angeles, which is very, very urban. It's south of downtown LA. And to find this bat detected in this tiny little garden um, within this urban matrix uh, was really exciting. And so to take it to the next level, we started going to people's backyards because if we can find it in an urban garden, what else is out there? What else is in these other neighborhoods? So we partnered with these family members, like you see here, many more than this, but they were thrilled to be part of an effort to engage with the museum, first of all, and, and have that unique interaction, but they also um, were integral at our success, at, at figuring out what species were here, what was possible. Um, we studied over 40 sites within the past three years, and every single site has detected at least one species of bat. And even myself as a bat biologist, I didn't even expect that um, to be the case. I thought maybe some neighborhoods, yes, but especially very urban neighborhoods, which is what we've been focusing on, would be absent of bats, even the most urban adapted bats, like the Mexican free-toed bat. And so um, here's another great example. So here's a, of a 
this is a hoary bat, very similar to the red bat as far as its behavior. It's a migrant, from, goes from southern Canada all the way down to Central America every year and back. And again, only roost and foliage, same, same genus as the western red bat. And so to, all of a sudden, we detected it just a few months prior to this photo at our museum in the gardens again. And then a few months later around Christmas, um, someone, one of our staff members just happened to spot it on our wall um, within our gardens. And what was ex exciting about this opportunity was that not only did, were people not afraid when they saw this bat and, um, and just perplexed, they were actually excited and had some background information about this bat and knew exactly its ecological role, service, and function within LA. And because there are educators on staff, it was a perfect opportunity to connect the general public that were still in the gardens at that point with this bat. And so one of our uh, educators brought out a spotting scope and brought, gathered as many people as he could um, to, to check out this, this rare bat within the middle of LA. Um, and so um, that was just a really great opportunity. And this is another uh, great story where um, I went to USC for my undergrad and I've, I've been a big football fan of this uh, school since I was a little boy um, and still am. And so I took my, we, I went with my family to a football game but because um, I'm also a bat nerd, I had a little bat detector in my pocket. Um, and in case there was a bat. And so uh, I was watching the game. My little brother was like, Miguel, there's moths getting eaten by bats at the stadium lights. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense that moths would be there. But bats in the middle of this football game with the marching band going and everything. And sure enough, I looked up and there were bats zigzagging up and uh, around those lights and eating moths. And because I had that little bat detector, I stood up and blocked the view of the people behind me and started recording bats. And because I had this really cool device, I was able to figure out right then and there what species were flying overhead. And I think this is where I feel like the next step is for community science because yes, this is a really, weird situation and i'm sure that's what you you would think too if i started blocking your view of a football game to listen for bats but my goal is as this technology gets cheaper more accessible and more people are knowledgeable and aware that bats are here that they're important um then hopefully one day there'll be a huge stadium full of people with these devices in their pockets and always looking not just at the football game but what other wildlife are sharing this space with them and that even though they're at a football game doesn't mean they're separated from nature and i think that's just a small example of what um, our museum and our programs are trying to um trying to spread is that type of awareness um, and also going to these communities. So this is a, a community event in Watts, California, a very urban part of South Central LA. Um, it was very park poor. Um, and here's also a school in Watts. Um, and I was putting detectors at this school, had the opportunity to talk to the students about the bats I was detecting at their school, uh, but also did community events like the one you saw before, um, which takes it to another level. So instead of me showing off some of the more sexier animals like mountain lions and bobcats and, and getting people to touch pelts, what they actually gravitated more towards were bats that I was telling them I was detecting blocks away or right over their head above this classroom because it made that story more personal to them, especially in neighborhoods where they felt that they were disconnected from nature um, and that really nature and this type of work is not for them because of that. And so uh, I felt it was empowering for me as an educator and a scientist, but also hopefully inspiring for them and gave them the access to nature that they deserve through this process. And here, yeah, that's an, a hoary bat in flight. If you just, that's just a really cool shot. Um, that, that is a map of, yeah, so yeah, it's a, 
really good photographer that took a picture of that hoary bat um, mid-flight. And then this uh, map is really cool because it's kind of a snapshot of what we're finding uh, generally in LA, which is that bats are being detected everywhere. So the bigger the circle you see there, um, the, the more um, activity there is at that particular site. The darker the circle, uh, the more species. And so it's as simple as that. Um, and this map here is showing all the detector sites that we've had over the years so far. Uh, we're gonna add 20 more pretty soon um, in South LA. And every single bat, uh, excuse me, location, like I said, detected a bat, which is amazing. And uh, it's a huge statement um, for us to share uh, about wildlife and urban wildlife and their resiliency. Um, and the, the fact that we found four species of special concern, species that were thought to not only be rare, not even exist in urban areas, but rare in California, we're finding in the middle of the city. So just by looking, it's not really trying to boast myself as this really innovative scientist, but more so that you just have to be opportunistic. You have to look where people are, are just avoiding and, and not taking the time to look. And partnering with the communities, even if it's a little bit more logistically complicated, it's worth the payoff, not just for the, the species discoveries, but also the engagement that you're able to do. And so here's a representative of 12 species that we've detected over the past three and a half years, four of which, like I said, are species of special concern, one of which um, I just had detected a couple years prior, in, which is the Western Mastiff bat, the biggest bat in North America. And that bat was thought to be extinct for 10 years, till myself and the Forest Service detected it at the LA Zoo in Griffith Park. And so, um, so yeah, those are just really inspiring stories that, um, that make this type of work successful in, in a lot of different ways. And here I am climbing a ladder to put up a bat detector above a gymnasium at a school very close to the museum in South LA. <laughs> So, yeah, so this is kind of going backwards in time a little bit, but this, this story is always current and relevant. And so, uh, like I said, I grew up outside of Griffith Park, which is the home of the Hollywood sign, um, the observatory, the LA Zoo, um, and not really a place that people think about um, as a place, for, uh, urban oasis for wildlife, but it is. And um, I grew up using the park as as, uh, as a lot of other urban kids, to be honest. Um, even though it is this amazing wildlife oasis, a lot of people are unaware of that, and my family included at the time. And so I would go there to play, play catch with my family, have a barbecue or a quinceanera, um, maybe go for a hike, but for exercise, not to identify plants or animals. And um, so, but nonetheless, there are animals like coyotes and skunks and and et cetera, that were roaming through my neighborhood because of our proximity to the park. And fast forward a few years, uh, coming back to LA on a mission to study um, carnivores in this park to give back in my own way, I end up discovering a mountain lion, and his name is P22, which stands for Puma 22, um, in the middle of this park uh, that I grew up going to that I never imagined would have a mountain lion in it someday. And I didn't even know what a bobcat was or a Western gray squirrel was as a kid, even though um, they were there. Um, and so this photo is really, or this story is really inspiring to me because this animal, this individual crossed two major freeways, the 405 freeway, um, and then went through Beverly Hills, Bel Air, um, and close to Hollywood, he crossed the 101 freeway, another eight lane freeway to cross into Griffith Park. And he's the first mountain lion to ever be recorded doing that. And Griffith Park is a big park. It's one of the biggest parks in, this, in the country, uh, bigger than Central Park. Um, but it's a fraction of the size of what a regular male mountain lion would need for its territory. So usually a male would need about 200 square miles and Griffith Park is only nine square miles. And the fact that he stayed there and being able to coexist with people, like thousands of people go through that park every day and there hasn't been an incident with a human. Um, eight years later, he's still going strong. Um, 
it's it's a pretty amazing story um, and very inspiring to a lot of people. It's a story of survival, which a lot of people can resonate with. And Miguel, if I'm if I remember correctly, that also contributed to uh, an overpass or something that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so he's not just an ambassador for urban wildlife and LA wildlife, but he's also an ambassador for our very imperiled mountain lion population here in the Southern California area that are um, basically almost going extinct and it's estimated within 50 years they will go extinct if connectivity, habitat connectivity is not improved. And so there's a, been a campaign for many, many years to build a bridge across the 101 connecting um, the Santa Monica Mountains to the Santa Susana Mountains to the north of the 101 freeway but um, it's been unsuccessful because nobody was really rallying behind mountain lions at that point um, or really understood the importance and significance of it. But all of a sudden this P-22 story came out in the news and that Hollywood photo, this photo um, went viral. And now there's celebrities that are talking about P-22. Um, and he's this amazing wildlife celebrity that is really carrying this campaign, which is the Save LA Cougars campaign um, that's um, it's, um, run by the National Wildlife Federation. And so it's amazing to, to see how just a simple engaging uh, story can really um, save a population potentially, um, amongst other things. Totally. That was, that's awesome, Miguel. I'd love to, we just covered, you just covered a lot of different topics for the um, huge spectrum of work that, that you are involved with both throughout LA and around the world. Um, and I'd love to just start, I have a few questions, a few comments um, of different aspects of your work that um, maybe we can discuss for the audience. Uh, a lot of it in terms of the technology is, is something that I think from an XPRIZE perspective, we're really interested in right now in terms of innovating tech and getting it in the hands of um, people around the world to survey biodiversity like you've been talking about. Can you go a little bit more into detail about, um, I know we touched on camera traps. Uh, in those images, we have GPS collars on cats, um, the audio recorders, and, and even iNaturalist. I know that, uh, you throughout all of your work are kind of at an interface of many different forms of tech that are being utilized to collect data um, on these animals. And I'd love to um, hear a little bit more about any aspect of the trials and tribulations of working with tech in the field. Um, yeah. Just any of this that uh, I'd love to go back and forth with. Yeah, sure. Um, so technology is man-made, right? So there's always, uh, mistakes that are made or things aren't just made efficiently or meant for the field or every single environment. So that's one, um, I don't know, risk for using technology, uh, especially new technology um, in the field. And so that's always an ongoing thing. And there's all, it's always getting better, which is exciting and, and um, inspiring. Um, so the first technology that I was introduced to were camera traps. And um, when I started with camera traps, they're actually film camera traps. Um, and it was just this crazy idea and the, they were super expensive and clunky and you have to wait a while like for your film to get back from the food, photo studio to see what you got. And uh, eventually it turned into digital, but uh, and then also the there was white flash. It was an infrared flash. So white flash is just the regular flash that you use on your camera um, at home or a personal camera as a big flashy bulb. Um, and we've learned that for some species that is a deterrent. And um, and they've developed um, infrared flash since then, which is basically um, sometimes visible to wildlife still, but not as um, spooky as as a big white flash um, and so they even made it darker now that's almost invisible to, to wildlife depending on the type of flash but um, so that's one advancement also the integration of video into camera traps um, that was something that happened while I was kind of um, 
moving along in my career and also really key at now seeing behavior that you weren't able to see just with a simple photo. Um, with those photos, you're able to kind of get evidence that the animal is there, count some spots if it was uh, um, individually identifiable by their spot or pelt pattern. Um, but beyond that, uh, bobcats and jaguars are examples, or tigers even are examples that each one has identifiable markings like a fingerprint. Um, but beyond that, you wouldn't be able to tell, say much about its behavior unless like it was carrying a prey item in its mouth at the, that point in time. And you can get an, a good look at it and see, oh, it, these animals actually feed on this species and we never knew that. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's hard to see behavior without video. Um, so that was a huge advancement that um, has happened, um, oh, made it accessible, yeah, more accessible. And then same, similarly, um, here's an example of a GPS collar. This is a replica, exact replica of what is around P22's neck. Um, so here's the satellite transmitter, here's the battery. And when I started in this field of work, um, I was also helping study urban bobcats in Irvine, California, which is in Orange County. Um, and we had to use telemetry and that's still uh, uh, yeah, with an antenna, we use a radio signal to locate that cat with triangulation. Um, and it's still done today as like usually a backup or a cheaper alternative to GPS uh, collar technology. Um, but now with GPS collars, you basically can get eight points a day without sending anybody into the field. Um, and they're very accurate and telling. Um, and these collars now, this one in particular, can last about two years without having to drug the animal um, and stress it out um, more often than you need to. Um, so All of the tech too has come such a long way in terms of the camera trapping from the trail cams um, yeah. that are still the least expensive to SLR cameras. Um, and even camera trapping on smaller scales for even bats and insects and all sorts of things like that. But the GPS trackers as well, because of the size limitations of what they uh, used to have to weigh in order to transmit uh, those data, now those are, I mean, we're putting telemetry and like GPS trackers on, you know, dragonflies and things like that and tracking them for, from satellites. So, um, it's pretty remarkable in, in even just the past five or 10 years, the scale at which, you know, a lot of the things that you're talking about, um, even with P22, these bigger animals could outfit some of these larger pieces of equipment. And now we're able to basically surveil a lot more biodiversity in a much more intimate way in real time, um, gathering all these different data points consistently but also, like you say, with the video, I mean, some of the behavioral aspects that we're able to see of how individuals interact sometimes, um, it's yeah. crazy. I mean, it's crazy seeing some of the footage that comes out or, um, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. <laughs> I know we have a couple questions. I'd love to uh, bring up sure. one and people feel free to um, add questions in here and we'll address them as we go along and also at the end, uh, but we have a question of bats seem to get such a bad rap. What is something that you find fascinating about them that you wish uh, more people knew? I think we both have plenty to talk about on this one. <laughs> yeah, um, I can go on for a long time, but I'll keep it to a few points. But um, I'll talk about LA specifically, or in general, bats um, basically make over 20% of the mammal species on Earth. Um, which is an amazing number. Most of those individuals live in the tropics. Um, and, and so, and most of them are insect eating animals. And by being insect eating animals, um, they provide huge services to us um, from a safety health, health standpoint and also economic standpoint. And so, um, for instance, um, for the fact the fact that they eat crop pests, for instance, is a huge service to our agriculture industry and saves them, I think on average, about $3 billion a year 
um, because they're saving on um, with, on the cost of using pesticides um, or just the loss of their crops. And obviously what that does for us is helps our economy, makes those vegetables and fruit uh, cheaper at the grocery store for us um, if they're not so rare. But also um, there's other bats like fruit bats, like the flying fox, which are seed dispersers because they eat these tropical fruits out in the Philippines or Australia or India and are more willing than bats, excuse me, than birds to fly over um, clear cut areas. Um, and by doing that, they're spreading the seeds and regenerating forests more so than birds are. And so um, that's an important service they're providing that way. Um, and also because a lot of, uh, some of them are eating mosquitoes or a lot of them are eating mosquitoes, um, that is helping us as well. Mosquitoes are annoying, um, but also they're the most dangerous animal in the world because they kill the most people uh, because of all the diseases that they potentially carry. And so having this, these bats around um, is keeping us safe and, um, and less itchy. And so that's, that's a really great thing to think about when you're grossed out by a bat and you got to kind of think about where does that stem from? Is it because of a Dracula movie you saw? Someone told you that vampire bats are everywhere. And to be specific, I mean, about vampire bats, vampire bats um, in LA don't exist. They are south of the border. They're Mexico, Central America, Latin America. Um, and only one of those species of vampire bats feeds on, feeds on mammal blood. The other one feeds on bird blood. And, um, and I think that's something to think about. Even the one that feeds on mammal blood is going after livestock primarily that's left out in the open. Um, and so, yeah, it's not, it's not, they're not the vicious, scary animals that people think they are. They're not going into people's hair and getting tangled on purpose. Um, I don't know why that's a common thing to ask, but, uh, and um, yeah, they're not aggressive animals. I think a lot of it for many people is, um, you know, you, you see this with a lot of animals that are active at night that uh, right. people don't see as well. And so it is interesting all the, all the ways in which you can use audio recorders and things like that to, to learn more about them and, and the ways that you're interacting with communities in LA to show people what bats are in the neighborhood yeah. um, helps to bridge this gap of, you know, it's, it's similar things to like sharks and, and other stuff that it's really related to a lack of understanding that instills this fear. And um, I mean, to be honest, a lot of people, when they actually see photos of bats up close, like some of the ones that we flipped through tonight, they're, they're adorable. Um, <laughs> like people, if you took just a profile shot of a bat's face, people would think they're like a bulldog or a pug or something like that. <laughs> um, but also they're fascinating. So like what you mentioned about um, the diversity of bats in the, in the tropics, I mean, in the tropics especially, they're more than half of the mammal species. And that in itself has driven um, all sorts of other diversification because there's such a strong force of uh, predation in the night sky. Yeah. And, and that's what my work on bats was, was about predator prey interactions between bats and insects and studying right. how, how many insects have evolved specifically to escape bats. How many insects have evolved ears to hear echolocation and mechanisms to jam echolocation just to escape. And even, I mean, like some of our research pointed to the likelihood of butterflies evolving from moths out of the night sky just to escape the sheer pressure of bats at night. And so yeah. um, there are all these rippling effects, uh, certainly, you know, pollination, what you said about crops and everything like that. They provide all these functions that we don't even have any idea because they're out there at night when, right. and and communicating largely out of our um, audible spectrum. So a lot of it's misunderstanding. And when you actually start to get to know them, you will, uh, you'll fall in love. Most definitely. Maybe we'll see. They also, <laughs> they also pollinate for those interested agave, which is an important uh, 
product in in some for Tequila. some people. So there you go. <laughs> um, let me see a few more questions here. What are ways to protect to help protect bats around urban areas? Um, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is um, advocacy, to be honest. Um, people can put bat boxes up, for instance, and provide extra habitat for them. And, but even in the most perfect settings and setups, it can take about three years for them to occupy those, those um, boxes. Um, not using pesticides um, on your plants. Um, using native plants that attract native insects that they feed upon, that's helpful and talking to your city about that you want bats around, um, that you don't want everybody to consistently be cutting down old trees and trimming trees, and especially when it's pupping season, when they're the most vulnerable. A lot of another, another misconception about bats is that they're these prolific animals that reproduce like rabbits, that are short-lived, there's plenty to go around, and it's not the case. They basically have the life history of a large mammal and they're long lived. They can reach up to 30 to 40 years um, in age. Um, they reproduce about once a year and usually it's one to two pups a year. And, and so for all those reasons, uh, it makes them very vulnerable uh, to being extirpated from an area. And if you're cutting down a tree and wipe out an entire uh, roost, then that's a huge chunk of the population that you just eradicated from that area. Um, and so, I don't know, I just think thinking about changing your mindset and what's like balancing what's aesthetically pleasing to what's good for ecosystem, what's good for environment and keeping it in balance. There's, um, also, there's a lot of research coming out now about um, noise and light pollution and the impacts of like of right. these aspects of our own existence in more densely populated areas. Um, and, you know, things like bats do suffer more than others because they are somewhat in many ways out of sight, out of mind. And so, um, but you see, you know, a lot of migratory pathways of uh, birds and bats um, and even insects being altered uh, by urban areas now because of noise and light pollution. So, um, yeah, very true. Yeah, very those true. are some great questions. Another one, another question here. Growing up in Austin, we loved, oh, I'm guessing it's going to be about that bridge in Austin. There's a huge Congress bridge. bridge yeah. <laughs> uh, growing up in Austin, we loved our bats, but still had a fear of rabies. How likely is an LA bat to spread rabies? I'm not going to say it doesn't exist because rabies has been detected in bats within LA County, but it's not common. Um, and um, yeah, and so rabies is a deadly disease for bats. And so, um, so there's not like they're going to be flying freely and carrying that disease um, and living forever uh, as these dangerous transmitters of that disease. And, and also there's a, I forget what the stats exactly were, but the CDC did a, did a study on bats that had rabies-like symptoms and only a small fraction, I think between five and 10% of those bats had rabies. And so the likelihood of a bat having rabies is very slim, um, but I definitely wouldn't recommend picking up a bat off the ground or anything like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think for the most part, you're you're definitely safe. Um, yeah, the chances think, are very low. Uh, besides those of us who physically handle them regularly and have to get your titers checked all the time and get your boosters for rabies vaccines, um, it's very minimal. But I would say on this note that the time that we're in now with the pandemic is actually. Um, Fascinating and terrifying in terms of the how prolific the impacts of environmental degradation are um, on humanity now, and and something like COVID nineteen has certainly been tied to uh, in ways wildlife trafficking and zoonotic diseases, and so at some point it's likely that um, COVID was. Uh, passing through bats in some way that never would have interacted with humans had there not been 
um, opening up of tropical forests that exposed them to wildlife trafficking, that exposed them to wildlife markets and became, uh, came in close proximity to dense urban populations that were actually um, uh, for possible consumption and things like that. So there are all these sequential steps of our, as a species, misuse of resources and the environment that are actually um, exposing us to more of these things that, you know, like rabies, yeah, it's always there, but there are these other things that, you know, we're dealing with on a global scale right now that are dangerous warning signs, uh, not even warning signs, dangerous realities of where we are at because of a lack of um, sufficient management of environmental uh, resources around the world. So, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I think, I mean, another thing that we try to do at the museum is this focus on not just the benefits, but um, how exciting it is to have nature around you and to explore it. And, and so, yes, it's good to be knowledgeable about um, the risks of, or dangers of wildlife, but uh, for the most part, it's good to know that um, it's important to have nature around and all the benefits of it um, from mental health benefits to having a balanced ecosystem um, or even property value benefits if that's what you prioritize. And so um, I think um, ways that we can engage people and, and using our creativity not to destroy habitat and figure out ways to get really rare species out of forests uh, that they depend on, but use that creativity to engage people on a different level. For instance, we have a competition called the City Nature Challenge where we're getting people that weren't thinking about nature or exploring nature ever in their lives, but are doing it for the first time because they happen to like competition. Um, they like to compete. And now they're avid naturalists because that was their way in. And, and it's important to figure out, use your creativity to meet people where they're at and make this work relevant um, and so if it's relevant to them, then there's, there's more likelihood that they'll be stewards and encourage their communities to be stewards of, of these populations. Absolutely. Way to bring it full circle there. I think um, so many aspects of this are uh, actually, I think, coming back to the forefront. It's an interesting aspect of you mentioned mental health people are realizing through the lockdown that we're in now, you know, I think prior to that, you and I have our own relationship with nature now, but the majority of, I think, the, the human population, many people especially uh, are used to the conveniences of everything being able to be delivered or not having to go out of your home to have access to the whole world. Um, and it has impacts in terms of not being a, being exposed to the outdoors. Um, and I think what I've seen uh, just, you know, through interactions with people over Zoom is um, a lot of people realizing the importance of that, that I think I certainly live in such a bubble of that is critical to my entire existence in terms of everything I, I do. But um, it's good to see that being valued and prioritized um, in the ways that it is now. And certainly I think one, one aspect of uh, all of this is for people to know that through the LA Natural History Museum, through the work that you're doing, um, people can get involved with, with citizen science, actually contribute to data collection, especially through, um, if, you wanna, if you wanna say a couple more words, just about the iNaturalist program that you're yeah. working on, um, because yeah, I think that's definitely. a brilliant way to, to connect with nature. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, as an example, I'll talk about, because I already talked about the squirrel survey, I'll talk about the City Nature Challenge a little bit more, where it started off as a simple competition between Los Angeles and San Francisco, and now there's hundreds of cities all over the world involved. Um, and every year it's a competition, who, what city can find the most wildlife or recruit the most observers within a week period. And this year, because of COVID-19, um, we had to change gears, uh, switch gears. And, but it was, it was really um, 
hope, helpful to see how people responded to this challenge. And instead of making it a competition, it was more of a celebration of slowing down, being more aware of your natural surroundings and, um, and sharing what you have to inspire others and make someone else's life or day a little bit better by sharing a photo that you found in your backyard, your personal space, um, or even within your own house or apartment. Um, and I think it makes people feel less lonely um, when we can do things like that with each other, um, but also encourage people to care more about wildlife and making it easy for them and accessible by having it on a really easy to use app um, that's free to download, um, allows people to contribute to science and explore and engage with nature like they never did before. And um, I think that's something that um, everybody should celebrate and um, just being more aware and slowing down. And, and I mean, life is, can go by quickly. And with the pandemic, um, it's, it's easy to kind of focus on all the negative things, but because you're slowing down a little bit, because there's not much you can do in this situation, unfortunately, um, you also have opportunity to be aware of things that you didn't really take notice of before or felt like that weren't part of your everyday life, but really are, and just been right under your nose this whole time. Absolutely. And then on our end, I mean, I would just say uh, on a international scale, this is branching out of the local um, level where I think the most impact can always be made. Um, but XPRIZE, through the Rainforest XPRIZE, is, is doing a lot of work around the globe, working with local NGOs, local universities, um, local researchers in our Rainforest XPRIZE to deploy novel technologies to incentivize the innovation and advancement of a lot of the tech that, um, Miguel, you mentioned tonight. I mean, over the past 10 years, how all of those different aspects of tech have improved. Yeah. Um, that needs to continue improving, but also get in the hands of more and more people um, in communities around the world. And so just scaling all of this up on a global level, because uh, there really isn't time remaining in terms of a lot of the environmental uh, and social issues that we face currently um, around the world. And so through the Rainforest X Prize, we're really working to um, revolutionize the movement uh, in that respect of um, more rapidly and remotely, autonomously being able to um, survey and document rainforests to inform conservation action and policy uh, in real time. And so um, for anybody listening, more information from that can be found at rainforest.xprize.org. Um, and Miguel, it's really, really been a pleasure chatting with you tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to this whole series with the LA Natural History Museum. Um, but honestly, I, I love your work. Uh, thank you for sharing some great images. Um, and also, thank you for what you do. I mean, everybody that uh, is listening, I think XPRIZE and the LA Natural History Museum are um, in the same general neighborhood. And so there are a lot of opportunities to get involved on many different scales through both organizations. And so it's a very exciting time to get involved uh, and with new initiatives when we are so confined in our locations. But um, thanks again for sharing so much about your work and the impact of your work and the importance of it to, uh, to so many communities. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Bye. Thanks everybody for joining.